China's zero COVID policy lockdowns in Shanghai have been draconian, to say the least. What are the humanitarian costs of these protocols? And is it realistic to aim for zero cases of COVID at this point? Joining me to discuss this and much more, president of the Population Research Institute, author of Bully of Asia, Stephen Mosier. Steve, let's begin with China's zero COVID strategy. It's total lockdown in Shanghai. It's being reported this week that children are wearing hazmat suits on their way to school. The elderly are basically locked in their homes. Uh, food shortages are looming uh, or already being felt. What has been going on there for five weeks? Uh, it, it's really mind boggling. Shanghai is a city of 26 million people. How much longer can this feasibly go on? Well, I, I think it will go on until the uh, Chinese Communist Party leader, Xi Jinping, has a lock on a third term as president of China. Mm. Because what this is all about, Raymond, is politics. That's its first, last, and always about politics. It has nothing to do with epidemiology. I mean, every person on the planet recognizes that we're simply going to have to live with coronavirus from now on in the same way that we've lived with the seasonal flu. I mean, even countries that clung to China's mass containment model back in 2021, like Australia, Germany, New Zealand, they're now abandoning it. China is the only, the Lone Ranger out here still trying to impose COVID zero. So it makes no sense mm -hmm. in medical terms. And uh, it makes no sense, obviously, in economic terms, because we've got right. 500 container vessels outside of the port of Shanghai. We've got uh, the Chinese uh, GDP will take a 1% hit this year because of the lockdown in Shanghai and the lockdown in other cities. So when I say it's politics, mm. what I mean is this. I mean that Xi Jinping wants to be president for life. He wants to be the new Red Emperor taking over Chairman Mao's position. And he will do anything to continue to hold power in China. His main opposition, Raymond, is based in Shanghai. It's called the Shanghai clique. Uh, these are the people who mm -hmm. ran China in the 1990s and the early years of this century. People like mm -hmm. Jiang Zemin and Zhu Rongji, who's actually spoken out, the, the former president, the former premier, who's actually spoken out against a third term, a third five-year term for Xi Jinping. Guess what? Uh, the mm -hmm. power base of the people who oppose Xi Jinping is now locked down tight. Local officials are being punished for not enforcing the lockdown. What is that doing? Mm. It's sending a message to the Chinese people, not just in Shanghai, but all over the country, that Xi Jinping is in charge and he's going to be in charge for a long, long time. That's what's going on in wow. politics all the time, every day. Now, in the footage we're seeing out of Shanghai and, and all, all over China, it's terrifying. I mean, they're, you know, they're grabbing bags and throwing pets and, and, and belongings yeah. in and dragging people out of their homes, uh, throwing them into these camps. It's simply unbelievable that this goes on in the modern world. But there it is. And worse, we continue to trade with them and support this barbarism. Steve, before I let you go, I have to ask you about this recent controversy over China making inroads into the strategically vital Solomon Islands in the South Pacific. Uh, China signed a security pact with the island's prime minister that could end up extending Chinese military power in that region. Now, for the sake of the audience, this is where Guadalcanal is. The U.S. fought here during World War II. What is the impact of this agreement, and how might it affect U.S. foreign policy and world security in the South Pacific? Well, China doesn't have very many foreign overseas bases. It has one in Africa, in Djibouti, on the Horn of Africa. Uh, it may have another soon in, uh, in Burma. Um, but this brings the Chinese Navy very close to Australia and New Zealand. It brings it about 1,500 miles away from Australia and New Zealand. It gives them a presence in the South Pacific and enables them to project power in that mm -hmm. region of the world. Remember that that Australia has been targeted for the last two years because right. the prime minister of Australia has been saying, we need to investigate the origin of the China virus. China doesn't like that. Mm -hmm. It doesn't want the invest the, that investigation to take place. Uh, it doesn't want to admit it came from the Wuhan lab. And so they're moving into the mm -hmm. South Pacific. And it's a danger for not just the uh, Australians and New Zealanders. Uh, we have Guam in the South Pacific, not very far away. Right. Right. Before we run out of time, I need your take on the current state of the Vatican-China diplomatic agreement. We discussed it a little earlier in the show, the details of which are yeah. still a secret, Steve. Uh, and yet another renewal is pending this September. 
Since the signing of this agreement in 2018, things have hardly improved for religious freedom as far as uh, Chinese Catholics are concerned. In a recent column, you write that there have been only six ordinations of Catholic bishops in China over the past several years. What's the game being played here, and why doesn't the Vatican protest? Well, what the Vatican was hoping, of course, a couple of years ago was that the 54 empty sees, which need bishops, would be filled under the new Sino-Vatican agreement. That hasn't happened, right? 48 of them still remain empty. The, that, the Catholic Church in China is still without leadership in most of the country. I think that's quite deliberate, and it mm -hmm. will continue. So if, if, if the, point, the appointment of bishops is a measure of the success of the Sino-Vatican agreement, I don't see how you can extend it. Not to mention that the Chinese, Chinese Communist Party leader, Xi Jinping, has said in the last few months that any organization that has foreign ties, any organization that takes direction from overseas is an illegal organization. All religious organizations must support the Chinese Communist Party. They must support socialism, communism, and they must advance the leadership of Xi Jinping. It's, it's remarkable. I mean, and, and what Father uh, Wu told us earlier in the show about what the locals are enduring on the parish level, on the faithful level, is really, it, it's all terrifying. And the United States and the world should engage or simply not trade with this barbarous regime. I mean, we talk about never forget what's happening before our eyes is, is just as potent and horrible. The human and, and religious rights infringements here. It, it, it's, it's, it, uh, we talk about this every week, Steve. We're exhausted talking about it, but it's going on day after day, minute after minute. Uh, before we go, Steve, do you see similarities in the way the Vatican treats Ukrainian Catholics similar to the way they treat Chinese Catholics? And should the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church be wary? Well, I think the Vatican has done <clears throat> almost nothing in terms of supporting the Catholic Church in China. There have been very few public pronouncements uh, from mm -hmm. either the Pope or anyone else in the Vatican. Uh, the only thing we've heard recently from Cardinal Perelin is that he wants to tweak the agreement a little bit, but he wants to extend it another two years. I don't think that can be encouraging for the Catholic population of China, given the ongoing persecution. Yeah, well, I await the concordant pact with Russia. That'll be next. We'll leave it there. Bully of Asia by Stephen Mosher is the definitive work on China's plans for global dominance. It's available in bookstores everywhere. You can follow Steve on Twitter. It's Stephen W. Mosher. And thank you for coming out. I know you weren't feeling all that well. You, you, you carried thank through you. like a trooper. Thank you, Stephen.